We're absolutely delighted to be joined by uh, the Right Honourable Dr Liam Fox, uh, MP. Uh, he has held a number of positions in government, of course, uh, most recently serving as Secretary of State for Defence at the start of the last Parliament. Um, he is the author of Rising Tides, Facing the Challenges of a New Era, and creator of OneMinuteFox.com, which I commend to you. It's my favourite version of Fox News is actually Liam's. Um, uh, we've had the pleasure of, uh, of hosting him today as he shares his views on the road to honest money. Uh, and I commend to you his article in today's Daily Telegraph, uh, if you haven't read it already. Extraordinary monetary policy measures were pursued after the global financial crisis and continue to be used today. These policies are actually associated with some pretty severe risks and unintended consequences, risks too often, I think, ignored by politicians and in political debate. And Liam's been looking at what we need to do to generate and properly measure long-term economic growth in the UK and generate a truly positive long-term fiscal outlook. I think our leaders need to take on some bold ideas and indeed need to return us to sound money and sustainable finances. And to share his thoughts on that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Liam Fox. Thank you. Well, good morning and thank you to the IEA for hosting this event this morning. Uh, and thank you to Beecham's All-in-One for getting me this far uh, in the morning so far. <coughs> it is almost universally accepted that the first duty of government is the protection of its citizens. And as a former Secretary of State for Defence, I'm only too aware of the external threats to the safety of our people and to our country. But there are other threats that I believe we have a right to be protected from. The debasement of our currency, the erosion of our earnings, and the devaluation of our savings. I believe it is fundamentally wrong for governments to engage in structural profligacy, spending excessively across the economic cycle and passing ever larger amounts of debt onto future generations. History is littered with examples of where economic failure led to compromised security. In my book Rising Tides I pointed out that in 1788, a year before the French Revolution, France was spending 62% of royal revenues on servicing its debt. The Ottoman Empire got to 50% of its budget uh, on interest repayments by 1875, with the final repayment being made by the Republic <coughs> of Turkey in 1954, 36 years after the empire had collapsed. The lessons from history are clear. If the destinations we wish to reach are security, prosperity and honest money, then the road we have to travel is that of fiscal restraint, and monetary realism. So today I want to look at how close we are to those objectives, especially in the light of the great financial shock that came to the global economy following the events of 2008. The policies of fiscal restraint imposed by the current government have seen our annual budget deficit fall from the terrifying heights of the 11.4% of GDP that we inherited from Labour in 2010 although at 5.7% today, it remains the third highest in the European Union. As the UK's national debt has grown from around £960 billion to over £1,600 billion today, so our debt interest has risen dramatically to around £50 billion per year, much more than we spend on our defence and security. Despite the Chancellor's drive for control over public spending, the job has been made more difficult by the government's commitment to ring fence some of the largest areas of expenditure which has meant increased distortion in the shape of our spending patterns and priorities. The government should have our full support in what will have to be tough spending rounds in the years ahead if we are to meet our fiscal objectives. We must however be clear that this is not a cyclical correction but a structural one and that we have passed for all time the high watermark of government spending as a share of our national income. Now the crash of 2008 was one of the greatest warnings we have had about the interdependence we share in the era of globalisation, the subject of my book, and how quickly contagion in one part of the global economy will spread to the rest. In medicine, uh, we often say that the most useful instrument a doctor has is a retrospectoscope. But it's worth asking, even with the benefit of hindsight, whether we believe the response to the 2008 crash was the correct one. Even if we accept that a huge injection 
of liquidity at the start might have prevented the worst of the slump, which most would agree with, but some would still dispute. What is the legacy that we have been left with? Even if we accept the best case, that extraordinary monetary and fiscal policy helped stave off the worst of the crisis, has enough thought been given to the causes of the crisis in the first place? Specifically, have we ensured that we have changed the patterns of behaviour that were such a major contributory factor to the crash? Perhaps a little, but not to the extent we should. What we've had on both sides of the Atlantic is more and more intended stimulus, the use of taxpayers' money to further bed the banks, and a failure to fully address the remuneration system in which the temptation of short-term personal gain produced irresponsible risk-taking with other people's money. On top of this, a persistent low interest rate environment has boosted the stock market and created cheap capital that has all too easily found its ways into overseas adventurous investments, especially in real estate and commodities, at least until recent price downturns in the latter's markets. Back in 2011, Kevin Dowd, Martin Hutchinson and Gordon Kerr made a pre presentation to the 29th Cato Institute Annual Monetary Conference, snappily entitled The Coming Fiat Money Cataclysm and After. Beautifully understated, I thought. And every so often, somebody produces a paper that I find of such interest that I put it in a little special pile at the side of my desk, and this was one such presentation. They argued that the US authorities had massively increased government intervention in the economy before, but particularly in response to the crisis, and by doing so had produced a diminished ability of the financial system and the broader economy to correct themselves. These policies, they said, aggravated underlying moral hazards that were a major proximate cause of the crisis. They undermined accountability and generated massive transfers to those responsible for the crisis who had already greatly enriched themselves in creating at the expense of everyone else. Even worse was the response of the political establishment repeatedly bailing them out with taxpayer cash with further bailouts likely to follow. This goes beyond mere cronyism, they wrote, and amounts to a takeover by the banksters of the political system itself. Then Simon Johnson, who as you know is a former chief economist of the IMF, went even further in his criticism. He said, elite business interests, financiers in the case of the US, played a central role in creating the crisis, making ever larger gambles with the implicit backing of the government until the inevitable collapse. More alarmingly, they are now using their influence to prevent precisely the sort of reforms that are needed and fast to pull the economy out of its nosedive. The government seems helpless or unwilling to act against them. Most seem to agree that even if the situation was not as bad in the UK as in the US, we were certainly beset with some disastrous management, RBS being an obvious example, where the perpetrators made off with huge financial rewards, leaving management, shareholders and taxpayers to pick up their mess with impunity. These critics argue, as many do, that the response of the authorities to the problem of 2008 was part of a pattern repeated over time. They argue that lower interest rates were responsible for one boom and bust cycle after another since the late 1990s, yet the response of the Federal Reserve in particular was to lower interest rates again and create an even bigger bubble next time round. They also <coughs> argue that this interest rate policy inevitably reduces savings and in the long run decapitalises the economy. I think these arguments deserve a good deal more scrutiny and I believe credibility than they frequently receive in this country. In the spring of 2009, the Bank of England introduced an emergency interest rate of 0.5%, the lowest rate in over 300 years. Over six years later, it remains exactly the same. So is this the longest economic emergency in our history, deserving of such prolonged divergence from financial orthodoxy, or has it proved to be an ineffective cure for our economic ills that we now find at a practical and political level too difficult or too unpleasant to unwind? I want to look at what's happened since our emergency rates began and perhaps more importantly, whether we might be repeating the behaviour that led to the crash in the <coughs> first place. Despite of the lack of attention given to some critics, it's not as though distinguished commentators have been silent on the subject 
in the intervening period, although my friend Liam Halligan regularly comments that many of them took their time to do so. Richard Dyson of the Daily Telegraph wrote in 2013 that there were a number of problems resulting from ultra-low interest rates. First, otherwise financially prudent young people were borrowing up to 95% of a property's value, even though the mortgage rate could only go up with all the implied accumulated financial problems for the future. Second, cash-rich depositors were turning to buy to let and purchasing rental properties despite having no real desire to be landlords because the returns on savings were so poor. And third, otherwise risk-averse savers were turning to new, potentially dangerous investments such as retail bonds, that's lending directly to companies, or peer-to-peer -peer lending, lending to complete strangers over the internet. And the problem was simply that savers were unable to get the same yields anywhere else. Ros Altman, now of course the pensions minister, Baroness Altman, wrote in The Guardian earlier this year that although the emergency interest rate may have initially avoided catastrophic deflation, the policy had since failed to stimulate consumption across the whole economy in the way that the government had hoped. Perhaps more importantly than the failure to stimulate consumption, she wrote, was the effect on savings of pensions, with pensioners seeing their annuity incomes fall as interest was squeezed. Additionally, pensions had had to pour, companies had had to pour billions of pounds into making up the deficit in their employees' pensions rather than reinvesting the money and stimulating recovery. And on top of this, while low official rates had lowered mortgage rates, the cost of borrowing in other ways, such as loans, credit cards and overdrafts, had risen as lenders had sought to increase their margins to remain profitable. The cost, incidentally, of all of these types of borrowing is now above 2008 levels. In other words, the transmission mechanism from low interest rates to increased consumption and economic growth is broken. Finally, Meryl Somerset Webb, the editor of, editor of uh, Money Week, wrote in uh, the FT this August that low interest rates and cheap money are encouraging capital misallocation. Companies are borrowing large sums of money but don't use it to expand or invest in R&D. Instead, they're pouring money into what she described as dubious investments. Since the crash of 2008, global corporate debt has more than doubled from 26% to 56% of GDP, according to McKinsey. When this driver of behaviour is combined with the increasing belief that governments will be there to provide bailouts, the ability to play fast and loose with other people's money and potentially avoid the consequences is all too real, precisely one of the types of behaviour that led us into the 2008 crash in the first place. Of course, there are those who believe that the addiction to monetary creation itself is a problem. In his informative and extremely readable book, which I would recommend, Paper Money Collapse, The Folly of Elastic, Folly of Elastic Money and the Coming Monetary Breakdown, Detlef Schlichter wrote, it's apparent that most commentators, politicians and central bankers do not want to give up the comforting belief that the government can always fix the economy with injections of more money. This means that ever more money needs to be eject injected to buy the system time and to manufacture another round of money-induced and thus temporary growth. And more interestingly, he continued, we have already reached a point at which ever more extreme measures are being taken. And over the two and a half years following the collapse of Lehman Brothers, the Fed expanded the part of the monetary supply that it controls directly the monetary base by more than $1.5 trillion, thus creating twice the amount of money of this type that the Fed had created in aggregate up to that point since its inception in 1913. That is the scale of the expansion. And what has happened to the Fed M2 measure since then? <coughs> it has risen from $7.5 trillion in January 2008 to just over $12 trillion by August this year. Similarly, the Bank of England's increase has been from just over one. Uh, 1,045 billion in January 2008 to 1,549 billion in August. The UK base money supply has quadrupled since 2009 as a percentage of GDP and the US money base has tripled. Now those who take a Hayekian view, those of the Austrian school let's call them, 
would argue that monetary creation in our present system is simply carried out for political goals. Injection of new money always changes economic processes and in modern economy these injections of money happen almost continuously and this process has reached its zenith in recent years. If we believe, as I imagine many in the IEA do, that deflation is most likely to occur when an economy is imbalanced by excessive levels of debt and inflated asset prices, then we should be attempting to rein in the supply of credit. Instead, we seem to be doing precisely the reverse. I would suggest that we are blowing bubbles rather than preventing them. Now, two questions which immediately spring to mind from this are firstly, whether or not QE has actually worked. And secondly, what our current approach tells us about the relationship of our central banks to central government. Recently, there's been an increasing chorus questioning whether QE has actually brought tangible benefits to the real economy. A growing number of bankers and economists have openly begun to question whether having lower, uh, lower long-run government interest rates actually feeds through to the key parts of the economy, especially small businesses. Large companies are able to borrow in the bond market, but small companies on whom long-term economic viability depends can face cripplingly high borrowing costs. Critics also point to research done by the Bank of England itself, which suggests that QE has boosted asset prices and household financial wealth, which is, and I quote, heavily skewed with the top 5% of households holding 40% of these assets. This has all brought a renewed focus on the relationship between central banks and central government, and rightly so. When state policy is assumed to have such a large economic and distributional consequence, what is surprising is that more scrutiny has not been applied to central bank actions. The government has a major say in the appointment of bank officials and the regulatory environment in which the bank functions. Since governments, especially those who are spending far more than they raise in revenue, have an interest in low borrowing costs, there's an added incentive for the central bank to keep interest rates down. In essence, central banks have become the government's <laughs> lender of first resort, and however independent they remain on the surface, they'll always keep their obligation to have the government adequately financed top of their agenda. It's not just that facilitating public finance is a key task of central banks, but history suggests that it's always the preeminent concern when push comes to shove. <coughs> Supposedly, the lender of last resort is defined as the discretionary provision of liquidity to a financial institution or the market as a whole by the central bank in reaction to an adverse shock which causes an abnormal increase in demand for liquidity which cannot be met by an alternative source. Many would argue that classic financial doctrine would suggest that this concept should be applied to only a single distressed financial institution only if it is solvent and only then at penal rates of interest on first-class security. Yet increasingly, critics claim that the central banks are attempting to bail out large parts of the financial system, even elements that are clearly insolvent and all at below market rates and against the flimsiest collateral. In the same presentation to the Cato Institute, Kevin Dowd and his colleagues gave a wonderful historical perspective to this, quoting President Andrew Jackson, which the, many of you will know, uh, whose presidency was characterised by his fight against the establishment of a central bank. And in writing about the second bank of the United States, a predecessor to the Fed, he said back in 1836, just hang on to that date, that, and I quote, the immense capital and peculiar privileges bestowed upon it enabled it to exercise despotic sway upon the other banks in every part of the country. From its superior strength, it could seriously injure, if not destroy, the business of any one of them which might encourage its resentment and it openly claimed for itself the power of regulating the currency throughout the United States. The other banking institutions were sensible of its strength and soon became its obedient instruments. In the hands of this formidable power thus perfectly organised was also placed unlimited dominion over the amount of circulating medium giving it the power to regulate the value of property and the fruits of labour in every quarter of the Union and to bestow prosperity or bring ruin upon any city or section of the country as might best comport with its own interest or policy. Today, almost 200 years later, 
there are still legitimate and perhaps even greater arguments to be had about the power and powers of the central banks, how independent they really are, and whether targets such as the 2% inflation rate target that guides Bank of England policy are appropriate at all times and in all financial circumstances. It would be to the good of our general political discourse and our financial approach to consider these arguments further. It's not to question the concept of independence of central banks as the left would love to, but to ensure that this independence is real and not a mirage. And the final point I wish to raise today is whether, in the midst of all these uncertainties, we are setting the correct metrics by which we measure our economic performance. In particular, whether we are sufficiently geared to the concept of wealth creation. We've long been fixated on the concept of GDP growth as the determinant of economic success, particularly in the political arena. It's taken as read that a good GDP number is in itself a sign of economic success, while a drop is immediately an excuse for political finger pointing. Of course, we would all much rather live in an economy with a growing GDP, yet as I and many others have often said, there's a difference between GDP and wealth creation, and it's the latter that ultimately determines our national prosperity. We create wealth when we take an individual's ideas, their unique IP, and turn it into a good or a service for someone else to buy. Consider the Keynesian idea of burying five pound notes in bottles in mine shafts and having the private sector dig them up, or Krugman's proposal to stage a fake alien invasion in the United States to boost anti-alien defense spending. Both would boost GDP, but neither would add anything to worthwhile economic activity. So are there other and better ways to measure whether our policies are conducive to wealth creation itself? I suggest there is. If we take government expenditure, government expenditure out of our GDP calculations, then the resulting measure, GPP, or gross private product, gives us a much better idea of worthwhile economic activity. In order to get a British perspective on this, I decided to take a look at the relationship between GPP and GDP over recent decades. The pattern is extremely interesting and I believe largely predictable. I asked myself, how easy would it be to look at these figures and from them predict which political party was in power? If we construct a ratio between the annual percentage growth of GDP and GPP for the last 35 years, then it becomes surprisingly easy to predict who's actually running the economy at the time. Since 1979, the Conservative Party has been in office for 23 years. Despite steering Britain through two recessions and inheriting the financial disaster of the 2008 crash, under Conservative management, GPP, gross private product, grew at a faster rate than GDP for 19 of those 23 years. By contrast, of the 13 years that Labour was in power between 1997 and 2010, 11 of them are characterised by either stagnation or contraction in the percentage of growth that originated in the private sector. In other words, Labour achieved their growth rates by pumping public money into the economy with the net effect of crowding out private sector wealth creation. And we can also see the alternative, how the private sector is able to grow when it's given the space. The only surprise to me in the end was that anyone would be surprised at all. Now, I am not an economist, but I am a stakeholder, a taxpayer, a mortgage holder and a saver. If not a policy maker, then I am as a parliamentarian a policy scrutineer. In none of these roles am I content with what I see. The British government is making a valiant attempt to reduce our deficit with the aim of eventually creating the surplus required to reduce our debt and with it the burden of debt interest which makes the reduction of the deficit itself all the more politically difficult. Yet what if the fear of rising interest rates and the impact on short-term political fortunes are holding us back from the decisions that might actually improve our chances of economic success and with it the revenues that will help us close the deficit gap without the need for future tax rises or even deeper spending cuts? What if, in terms of interest rates, we have got ourselves into the pusher and addict relationship? What if, 
addicted to the drug of cheap money, policymakers, especially <coughs> central bankers, are unwilling to cause pain for their political masters with a population and electorate, or at least a part of them, hooked on cheap credit. And politically, this is without considering the lunatic ideas of the current socialist resurgence in the British Labour Party that would create a whole new wave of excessive monetary expansion. Their so-called people's QE would be better termed an economic RIP. So what am I suggesting? In short, I believe we need to see a rise in interest rates as soon as possible. I would personally like to see the base rate rise by half a percent to put the bank on the front foot and for them to remain at levels more appropriate to a properly functioning capitalist economy. Only in this way can we rebalance the economy between borrowers and savers. An economy entirely geared towards borrowers, which is seen in some quarters as politically expedient, will not only become imbalanced, but will have a higher price to be paid of increasingly angry, bor angry savers the longer a decision on interest rates is put off. Also, we need to stop the mindset in which cheap capital can be used as a gambling tool at the expense of the long-term imprudent. Not only is this sending wrong signals about economic behaviour, but it risks the twin perils of underinvestment at home with the export of capability abroad undermining our own competitiveness over time. We also need to avoid the scenario where, in the case of a further global slowdown, policymakers have no short-term options. If we continue on our current trajectory of ultra-cheap credit and maxing out on QE, then should an economic slowdown arrive, it will, as will at some point, then policymakers would be no better than roller coaster riders without seat belts holding their hands in the air. The current government is absolutely correct in its resolve to achieve fiscal consolidation, and the Chancellor must continue to confront those who claim to share this end but continually challenge uh, his means of achieving it. Many economists argue that it simply suffices to get the debt to GDP ratio on a downward path by running modest deficits. Fortunately, the government has learned the most important lesson from the last crisis, that assuming growth will always continue unabated and that we will not be hit by adverse shocks in the future is not a good base for policy. As I often say, in relation to foreign and security policy, wishful thinking is a poor substitute for critical analysis. Of course, we have yet to confront the much longer drivers of debt for the government, the unsustainable promises made to future generations on health and pensions with an ageing population and all that that implies. These fiscal headwinds we know are coming down the track and will require us to have a fundamental rethink about how as a nation we are able to provide the pensions and health care the public expect. For all the action we have seen on the fiscal front therefore, longer term challenges await, but thankfully we have time to think about and to deal with those. Today my focus is overwhelmingly on the potential unforeseen consequences of monetary policy and whether in fact current policy is damaging our prospects. Our current approach is designed to deal with the last bust. The real challenge is to create a system that does not encourage the next boom in the first place. Thank you. Um, Liam, thank you very much indeed. We do have some time for questions, so uh, please put your hand in the air if you'd like to ask one, and I'll take, a, I'll take two or three together. So let's start with, with these two here. Yeah. And if you could just wait for the microphone and say who you are before your question, that would be great. Uh, John Wilkin, Chairman of the Salton Group. The pr Prime Minister has signalled his intention not to, con not to lead the party into the 2020 election. Do you think by doing this, uh, he's unnecessarily placed himself in the position which is faced by every second term United States president. And seeing as you know the leadership is going to be up for grabs, dare I ask you if you're thinking you're having another go at it? Thank you very much like you are a taxpayer, reluctant. Um, but I'm an entrepreneur and I'm also like you, not in the government, and I thought you articulated very well this morning why you're not. The road to honest money 
it seems to me, is a truncation of what really should be the title. It should be the road to honest money when it hits the chasm of democracy. You touched on that a little bit at the end. And I'd like you to hear a little bit more from you about the extent to which you believe it is actually possible in a democracy when so many people um, have been promised and the good life by the government, the state, um, and so many depend on it in terms of either benefits or in terms of employment, that you have, that there is any hope of actually um, people saying, right, I'm going to face reality um, rather than try and hope that I can postpone it until either I've gone or migrated somewhere else um, and the problem doesn't end up on my plate. Yeah. I'll take Douglas at the back. Uh, a brilliant talk. I agree with every word of it. Do you think we can return yeah, to? Can, can we, <laughs> <laughs> do you think um, we can return to honest money without reining in the ability of banks to create credit out of nothing and reining in the worst excesses of fractional reserve banking? Mm -hmm. um, the uh, first point on uh, on the politics. Uh, uh, there's a difference between. Uh, what's happening in this country, what would happen in a second term United States president. And that is that when David Cameron stands down, there will still be a Conservative government and there will be another Conservative Prime Minister. So there will be continuation in a way that there might uh, not be in the United States. And on your more specific point, no, you may not ask me. Um, <laughs> the, the second point, uh, uh, which I think is, is absolutely key, um, which is... Uh, this problem that happens when governments need to be re-elected um, but they may understand that the policies they're pursuing in the longer term may be damaging. Um, and it's, it's what I would call the concept of the vindication point in politics. In other words, you do things knowing that before your next appointment with the voters, your behaviour will be vindicated. Um, it's a discussion I'd had uh, more than once with... Uh, uh, Margaret Thatcher. And I think it's, it's, it's very important. And I think that uh, we have a political culture on both sides of the Atlantic, in fact it's a Western culture at the present time, which tends to constantly ask, is that what the public want? Now, um, I would take you back to uh, a medical analogy when I was still practicing as a doctor, or, or as my wife says, when you had a proper job. Um, if I did only what my patient wanted, and not what I thought was good for them, that would be unethical. If I didn't do what I knew was right for the patient, uh, and it ultimately led to their deterioration or death, I'd be up in front of the General Medical Council. So I would actually hope that the same ethical approach <coughs> would apply in politics. And it really ought to apply, and at its best it does. And it's called leadership. It's when we say, this actually will be difficult. We're having to go through a period of correction because we're too out of kilter. I'm afraid that it's going to be uh, uh, a painful process, a difficult process, but good things will come out the other end. Again, I go back to a medical analogy. If I said to you, by the way, you've got cancer, but that's tough, you'll have to live with it. Probably not a very possible, uh, uh, positive message to the patient. If I say to you, however, you've got cancer, we understand what it is, I've been through this lots of times before, there are, there's plenty of uh, reason to believe you'll be better, and when you do, your quality of life will be excellent. It's the same information in a different way. And in politics, I think we have to apply the same thing. We have to say to, in the economy, there needs to be a correction. I'm, in my view, we've overcorrected from the last crash. We now need to tighten up again. And the benefits of that tightening up will be that we can get back on a trajectory towards greater wealth creation and prosperity for your children and your grandchildren. And that, I think, is how we, we have to approach it. And I, I do not believe, and I've never taken this view, that voters are utterly selfish. People may be quite selfish for themselves, but they're not selfish for their children or their grandchildren. And when you, when you phrase it in, in the longer term, um, that's, ne that's uh, I think, a necessary way of doing it. And um, it is possible to do it. There's another doctor in the room, that's the problem. Shouting something different. Well, there may well be, but that's about arguing our case. And, and politics should never be about simply reflecting public opinion, otherwise we might as well give up all the government salaries and allow Maury to run the country for us. Um, we're there to shape and, and inform public debate. On Douglas's point, um, y you, you might be right, Douglas, and it would take a, a better uh, economist than me, than me to answer that. But, but what is uh, very clear is that your essential point, making money out of nothing, creating credit out of nothing, is a dangerous concept. 
Um, and I actually have uh, quite a lot of uh, sympathy, I have to say, uh, with the concept that your money needs to be based on something and that the constant expansion of credit with effectively the value of our money being based on sentiment and confidence, uh, which I think has been an increasing uh, element of policy across the West since Nixon came off gold in 1971, uh, is a relatively dangerous concept because what we are asking is that the economy persistently defies economic gravity um, and that uh, um, it's rather like being in a plane with no power and hoping that the, that the passengers' belief that it can fly will make it so. I'm reminded, Liam, on the sort of what people <coughs> say they want and what they actually want of that great Henry Ford quote where he said, if I'd actually thought about what people said they want, I would have invented a faster horse. Uh, um, I think there are a couple more questions at the front here. Let me take one, two, three. Uh, Alan Rankin, BB. Uh, Liam, uh, what solutions would you propose to the problem, uh, productivity problem? Uh, if um, George Osborne was sitting in this room, would he be with you to a sort of 60%, 70%, or would he think the whole thing is outrageous? Where would he be on uh, in, in listening to you? Um, it sounded like one of, one of your main points was the central bank should actually be independent and that would solve a lot of the problems. Is, is that the case and if so, um, what, would be, what would you consider an actually independent central bank? What would it have to achieve? And if I can just add an addendum to that, do you think that the, the sort of 2% inflation target is no longer what the, it should be given as its core remit? Right, love you all got. Um, uh, there's no doubt that our productivity gap in the UK um, is a problem. Um, we need to be, we need as an economy, we're not going to be able to challenge emerging economies in terms of cheap labour. We will therefore have to look to high-end uh, uh, um, services and goods that will require investment in technology, that requires a certain approach by government to encouraging that. I visited a very uh, interesting manufacturing uh, programme right in the heart of London last week. Uh, right underneath Somerset House, which is looking at low-cost, high-tech, um, so that we're getting huge added value. That's what we need to get into our economy. We'll not be able to achieve productivity gains or the level of prosperity we want by simply getting a lot of people into low incomes. Um, it's better than being um, on welfare, but we're, we're, we're trying to make up ground from a long way back. What we actually require is a high-end economy uh, if we're to be able to compete, and that also means uh, improving our educational system. Um, it's one of my bugbears, and I, I, I have cards on the table. I went to the second largest comprehensive in Europe, uh, in Scotland in the 1970s, um, um, and there were 55 kids in my form class, and they've got exactly the same entrance to university levels as they have today, with classes that are much smaller. We have real questions to ask about the quality of our state education in this country, and the fact we spend so much money on education and still have pupils unable to read, write, and count correctly when they finish their education is a national disgrace. We're doing, I think, a lot about that at the moment, but I regard that uh, as a key element to it. Now, it's far be it from me to say what George would uh, think, but um, uh, knowing him pretty well, uh, the idea that um, uh, we should give a little lecture to some of our colleagues that they can't demand fiscal consolidation and then object to every single means of doing so. Um, it is not possible to do it painlessly. Uh, this idea that you're going to take us from where we were, in fact, where we are now, 80 billion a year overspend, and it's called austerity, requires real some gymnastics with linguistics uh, to be able to get to that position. Um, we are still very, uh, at a 5.7% deficit, we are still hugely uh, exposed uh, in terms of our public finances and we need to get that number down. And if you think that we're on maybe a nine-year economic cycle and the last one started in 2008-09, um, we may have less time to get those public finances in order uh, before they're challenged again than, than, than some commentators might think. Um, and I think that the Chancellor is absolutely right and we've got the specific case of tax credits at the present time since uh, it's a question that's being raised a lot today. So the Chancellor's trying to get a four billion consolidation on that, taking us back to the tax credit levels we had in 2008, hardly the dark ages, uh, at the height of Labour spending. Um, and people are saying, well, 
notwithstanding the rise in personal allowances and what may come in the, the uh, path of uh, personal allowances in the future, notwithstanding the growth in earnings at the present time and the fact we've got negative inflation, uh, this is still too severe. I sometimes wonder um, whether people actually uh, have the political nerve today to do what they know to be right, even although it's unpopular, uh, and whether we now regard any measure that causes any level of controversy whatsoever as being too extreme. If that's what we think, there's no chance of achieving fiscal consolidation, and sometimes you've actually got to say, I'm sorry, we know it's painful, but it's going to have to be done. And even at that, it's a relatively small contribution to the level of consolidation we require um, over the coming years. In terms of bank independence, well, um, uh, Philip Booth is very, keen, is very uh, uh, keen on always talking about Scotland and Canada and concepts of free banking and whether we need to start to look at some of these models and whether uh, what we've had in the recent times in the United Kingdom in terms of restrictions placed on the central bank, additional powers for the central bank, more responsibilities for the central bank is against the culture um, that we've actually had for many years. Uh, again, um, he's given me a very nice reading list on that. When I'm finished reading it, I'll give you a better answer. Um, and the 2% inflation target, well, you know, um, in a global economy that's gone through what it's had since 2008, is it appropriate to have the same inflation targets that we've had in the period before that? Because if, we're, uh, if what we're saying is that the bank, in whatever circumstances, including where we are post-2008 crash, the bank has to increase and increase and increase monetary expansion in order to try to get us to 2% inflation. Where does that lead us in the current circumstances? It seems to me that uh, having a much more flexible approach to that, uh, rather than having it written in tablets of stone um, in a policy designed in 1997, would be sensible. Uh, and I'm against having the bank driven by very specific targets, which are narrow uh, and don't actually take account of, of broader economic movements uh, and, uh, and patterns since that time. Thanks. We've got time for a few more questions. Let me take these three then there, there, and then the lady at the front. Again, if you can introduce yourself, that would be great. Yes, thank you. Uh, Henry Reeve, Guido Forbes. So I suppose the theme of your speech was the need to challenge uh, conventional orthodoxies when it comes to central banks. And the big elephant in the room is Europe and the ECB. So would I take it from what you've said that you would support the right of ministers to challenge orthodoxies and to campaign either to leave the EU or to remain in? Cheers. Uh, James Brook, freelance journalist. Um, in your medical background, uh, have you become acquainted with um, the first responders manual, uh, which background in um, disaster relief? And um, if so, what economic measures can be uh, added to it that um, won't uh, prompt hostility uh, where there's a uh, tenuous but uh, positive relationship with a member state? Cheers. Helen Romer, Prospect Wealth Management. It seems that, I mean, it's an observation perhaps, but what can we do about education of the public? Because talk about, there is this problem with explaining uh, the problems that we have. And secondly, we talked about no inflation at the moment. But one of the ways governments have been able to get out of perceived problems is to inflate away the debt. And that, that also gives me concern. Um, well, I have to say that getting financial orthodoxy round to cabinet collective responsibility on the European referendum borders on genius. Um, uh, I think, uh, I think uh, that uh, on the European Union debate, the most important thing is that we have a genuine debate and that when it's finished, both sides feel that their case was adequately put without restrictions. And I think that any attempt to restrict the debate uh, will A, be unsuccessful, and is B, unwise. Because the legitimacy of the result will largely depend on the faith that the public have had in the process uh, 
and that they believed they were given full information by those who were saying what they believed and not what they believed to be a preconceived line. And, and I think ultimately that's where we will end up because I think that enormous pressures will be uh, unleashed when the referendum begins. And I think that uh, uh, many of those who were never in government or in parliament during the Maastricht debate don't quite understand the passions uh, that will uh, emerge from this particular debate. And uh, to go back to an earlier question, we will have to continue to govern this country after the European referendum. And how easy or how difficult that is will largely be dependent on how well we treat one another in the run up to that referendum and during that referendum. And any elements that introduce bad feeling or concepts of bad faith into that process will make the latter period much more difficult. So perhaps we should be thinking just a little more strategically um, on that point. Um, what do you learn? Well, what do I learn from first responders is rule number one, keep the patient alive. Um, and that's ultimately what we have to do. And you know what, if you break a few ribs uh, in, in getting the patient to continue to have a heartbeat, uh, that's generally acceptable, not least from the point of view of the patient. Um, <laughs> And uh, we, uh, we can learn quite a lot. You don't really want me to go into this because I believe I can do it at endless length, uh, getting into medical analogies and we'll be here till Christmas. What can we do about education? And that is it's just a brilliant question because when we <coughs> speak about these issues in an arena like this, we are assuming a certain level of understanding. And when I say I was talking to someone who I hugely respect, um, following a, a press conference, a, a, a party conference fringe meeting, they said, this was a, a real revelation to me because I've never really understood before the difference between debt and deficit. And now I do understand it. And when you point out to people that if you're running a deficit, i.e. you're spending more than you're earning, you're adding to your debt. And if you add to your debt, there'll be more debt interest. And that debt interest has got to be paid before everything else. And when you point out to people that, that 50 billion of debt interest that we have to pay this year is not a choice, we've got to pay it back, and it's going up every day, and that means we can't spend on defence or education or whatever it is you want, or tax cuts. After a while, repeating it, the penny begins to drop with people. <coughs> and they say, hang on a minute, you mean I'm actually paying £1,900 <coughs> tax this year for nothing except debt interest? Once you start to express it in terms they understand rather than economics, they begin to get pretty angry uh, about it. And when you point out that, by the way, it's going up next year, even if we do nothing, even if we continue our consolidation, it's still going up because of what we've already done. Um, people really do start to, uh, to uh, get narky about it. And it's therefore really important that politicians don't confuse the two and they don't um, talk about the deficit when they mean the debt and vice versa because it's really confusing for the public and it doesn't help us get our case across. Are there any more questions? From the on the oh, oh, sorry, yes. <coughs> but the problem with that is that governments have always assumed they could inflate away the debt. Tell that to the Japanese. Mm. Um, because it may well be that you end up in years of stagnation. And I, I understand that, I understand that, and, 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 and uh, I've got, uh, I know politicians who say, well, the easy thing would be to inflate the debt. Number one is, if inflation gets out of control, it's a very difficult genie to get back in the bottle. And it's fundamentally an immoral approach because it says you will transfer wealth from savers to borrowers. And if you want economic activity that makes people behave responsibly, you encourage borrowers. I think it's profoundly wrong to use inflation as a an economic corrective because it hurts those who've been the most prudent. Um, and I don't uh, regard making those who have saved and, uh, and done the, the correct economic thing for themselves. I don't believe impoverishing them for the sake of government mistakes is in any way a moral approach to public policy. And secondly, if they believe they can do it, they may not in fact be correct. But the QE effect, as, it, as you mentioned, has been to inflate assets, real assets, like cars, houses, whatever, and it's that. It is, well, I, I would argue it's the combination of accumulation of debt um, uh, on one hand, 
and asset bubbles running simultaneously that history tends to suggest to us is the worst risk of all. And that is, that's the risk of creating sudden uh, deflation. Um, and that's how you get into a bust of a cycle. And it seems at the moment that we are seeing government debt, total banking debt, household debt reaching record levels, and we're seeing asset prices, housing prices, up to recently most commodity prices start to rise. That for me uh, is more than one warning signal. Any more questions from the floor? We're right up on the clock. Got one more, one more here. Hi, George Miller, um, House of Chairman Group and uh, Concerned Voter. Um, just one point on your speech. It's a lot about, obviously, government spending too much and we need to take pay now in order to sort of enjoy future wealth. I think one glaring uh, sort of area where the Conservatives haven't done that is the triple lock of the state pension, which is essentially a, a promise that I will pay future generations something that's utterly unsustainable, I think, for my generation. And people need to understand the reality and no one focuses on it in any way. Can you perhaps explain if that policy will change? Or, you know, I mean, it's, it seems to be buying votes, which is a bit disappointing. Well, the triple lock pension was in our manifesto, therefore it is policy for this parliament. Would I personally argue for it to be reviewed? Yes, I would. Um, but I think as I, the point I was making towards the end is we have a number of intergenerational imbalances uh, that are now out there. And if you stand back and think about it, what we're saying to the next generation, which is smaller, um, that you will uh, uh, not only pay for the current generation's uh, debts and the benefits that they currently have, but that they will be extended irrespective effectively of your ability to do so, and you'll pay for your own, which you probably will never receive. Um, that doesn't sound like me to be a great social bargain. And I think we're going to have to have a much uh, wider debate uh, about how the generations relate to one another. And I find specifically, even more difficult than the point you raise, how we say to younger voters that they need to support the current range of benefits and pension provision at a time when their parents, uh, by a happy accident in many cases of the inflation that they have lived through, are sitting on housing assets who have of phenomenally greater value than they ever could have conceived, whereas their children are finding it difficult to get onto the housing ladder at all, uh, not just because of the uh, availability of mortgages, but the size of deposits they have to get because of the capital values. There are big problems in that. We're going to have to start to address that. Uh, and we can't have, a, as I say, uh, an economy either geared to totally towards borrowers rather than savers or towards one generation rather than another. We must keep these things in balance. Um, otherwise, um, someone's going to come along politically who says, I don't care about all these promises made in the past about pensions and benefits. All I care about are today's young voters, which will find a resonance. That would be a very unfortunate place for us to find ourselves in politically. Can I just finish and follow up with the last question from the chair then, Liam? Uh, the triple lock pension is, is one such example of this, but do you think there's been a danger with the fiscal consolidation uh, programme of this government and the previous coalition government that it's sort of been almost a bit less jam today in order to get spending down, but a lot more jam promised tomorrow? So you can actually potentially get the sort of deficit under control or edging downwards by making a few trimming cuts, but then if you're promising things like the triple lock pension, and huge other liabilities, you've actually worsened the long-term debt position, even if the spot price on this year's budget looks a bit better. So, for example, the, you know, our, our formal official national debt round about one and a half trillion. If you were to look at all of our liabilities and to assume that we're going to meet them rather than the default on them, you're perhaps looking at six trillion or more. Do you think that at the very least there needs to be a better way of this being reported in the Red Book or analysed by the OBR in order to try and get uh, politicians of all stripes to focus on that longer term picture rather than just sort of the immediate impacts of relatively small cuts in a budget in a given financial year. Well, thank you so much for that, Not um, <coughs> there, is, um, there is what I would call legacy debt, which is not debt that you're actually accumulating today but you'll necessarily, accu necessarily accumulate in the future because of policy decisions being taken today. And so uh, I would like that concept to be uh, 
uh, looked at when we are producing uh, our future projections. I would like the OBR to take that into account. In other words, uh, if we make a commitment or we introduce a policy that will in future create a liability for government, that should be included uh, when we're measuring um, what our future liabilities would be. Uh, otherwise, you are able to have uh, a fiscal consolidation today um, <coughs> effectively transferring the exposure to a future date. Um, and that doesn't seem to me sensible politically or prudent economically. And I think we need to look at how we uh, uh, measure that legacy debt uh, in the future um, policy uh, provisions that we, we bring forward. OK, we've gone slightly over time. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us on this Monday morning. Enjoy the rest of your week, but please join me in um, showing our appreciation to Liam, uh, having given us a really wide-ranging uh, speech, given us, I think, all a huge food for thought and quite a good few solutions as well. So please join me in thanking Liam Fox. Liam, thanks so much.